What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Guys, we're on the other side. We are in triple fragging digits. Episode 101. We did that last episode, though. <laughs> we already made it to triple digits. Yeah, but we had other things to talk about that. It was actually the 100. <laughs> now triple digits is the exciting thing until we hit quadruple digits. Okay. Because even 200 is like, oh, we just did another 100. Like, it's the same accomplishment again. It's still but pretty impressive. Look, this is podcasting 101. You get to be excited about 101. I figured someone was going to make that joke eventually. <laughs> Really? Because I just thought of it and did not expect it. So. I, I thought of it and then decided not to say it. <laughs> At least I'm surprised. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Was that Hot good? diggity. <laughs> yeah, that was good. We'll just keep that in the in the file for whenever we need it. What, you <laughs> saying hot diggity or Chris going, whoa? <laughs> well, I'm always emotive, so we're going to save it for Chris. Whoa, okay. Say gosh, I never say gosh. <laughs> well, it might be your new thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's my catchphrase yeah. now that's your 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 uh 101 to 199 episode <laughs> catchphrase we need something to put on the t-shirts gosh <laughs> gosh <laughs> just every time every time we say a number that has no context like that sounds exciting because it's a big number but you have no idea how big or small the number is you could just be like gosh <laughs> <laughs> and that'll be that'll be our code for an analogy Look, we're, we're improving the podcast in the podcast itself. We've made so many improvements in the first hundred, and this is our one improvement in the second hundred. <laughs> Unheard of podcasting technology right here. It's called live editing, and we're, we have a patent, so everyone back off. <laughs> Hopefully there's some actual editing during this, this uh, whole sequence right here. So anyway, what are we doing today, Marcus? <laughs> <laughs> well, get your patents ready, because today we are going to be improving bowling. Because our question is, how would you improve bowling? Um, I guess I'll start because you guys are laughing at me. Yes, um, we are. So the way I like to approach these improving sports questions that we do is to really like go down on what's fun about the sport in the first place and then just highlight that. So I imagine if you ask someone who bowls for real as like a hobby or, you know, semi-professional or professional, the answer is going to be something about like developing, you know, the technical skill, puzzling out how to get tricky spares. Uh, stuff like some other such nonsense like that. That's not where the fun of bowling is. They've, they've missed the point, all of them. When you really boil it down to its core, bowling is about it just being fun to chuck a big hard ball at a bunch of stuff and have it fall down. Yeah, ball fast, pin go down, you know? That's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and and like, if you think about the real, like, the way I it clicked for me was the difference between hitting a strike when you throw the ball really slow or when you hit the, throw the ball really fast. Like, when you throw, like, a regular slow amateur speed and you get a strike, it's exciting. And then, like, you look over and, like, someone just wings it down and the ball just, it just goes, like, <clears throat> that's awesome. So, my first instinct was to just replace the pins with a much more elaborate Jenga-type tower that was really fun to watch fall. But I don't think that's quite the right fun either because it, you do want to try a little bit. You don't want to just be, like, a, a video of, of watching a Jenga tower fall down. So what I wanted I th was interesting things to knock down. And it got me thinking about one of the real life, you know, quote unquote sports that I've been really wanting to try if it was anywhere close. And I am talking about Top Golf. Have you guys heard of Top Golf? I have heard of Top Golf. There's actually a, a Top Golf location near where my like family in Florida lives. We have almost gone to several times. I thought you were going to say your office and I was like, where? <laughs> Florida's kind of far away. My first instance of hearing Top Golf is you tying me about Top Golf a minute ago and me not knowing and not saying anything about it. <laughs> so Top Golf is a kind of it's not a new sport, but it's a new activity thing that you can go do. And basically what it is it's effectively a driving range. So you go out there, you have golf balls, you hit them with golf clubs. But instead of just hitting the ball into a field, there's all these like big targets set up, like in the grass. And the cool thing about it is that all the balls have little GPS chips in them. So you hit the ball out there, 
and it lands on the target and like you know you hit the blue target near the middle and it'll like you know the gps tracks it and it gets you that many points and so really what you have is like a like a smorgasbord board of things to hit your golf ball at and try and like oh i'm gonna go for the far target because it's more points or i'm gonna go for that one and that one this one that one and that's really cool and what's nice about it too is that it actually makes it a little bit more like going out bowling because instead of just going out to a you know out on a lawn you know next lined up next to a country bunch of people you actually do usually have like a semi-private room where you have like a little bit of seating a table sometimes there's food and drink service and so you have a place to hang out like you do in bowling and then you you know you golf so it's already working its way towards bowling so i think it's a neat idea but since it's absurd hypotheticals i think there's any reason we can't just repurpose it and take it about four steps too far along the way so the first thing and this might be more a personal choice but the first thing i'm gonna do is change the ball if you guys have ever played uh, candle pin bowling or a similar bowling variation that uses the small bowling ball instead of the big full size, you know, typical Americana bowling ball, you're missing out if you haven't tried the small one because it is so much more fun to throw that thing just really, really hard and fast. <laughs> it, it definitely is. <laughs> like a 16 pound ball or even like a 12 pound ball, like I can pick it up and I can throw it, but like I can't get, a, I can never, I'm never happy with the amount of oomph I can get on it. I actually prefer the big ball, but I can see why you'd like the, the small ball. It's because I'm small and weak. Um, uh, do, do you know what the maximum weight of a candle pin ball is, by the way? Because I just Googled it. I don't know. Uh, two pounds, seven ounces, as opposed to the, like, minimum, what, like, ten on a regular bowling ball? It's just enough heft. It's got heft, but it's not heavy. Exactly. It feels weighty, but you can still just chuck it. Right. And that's kind of where I'm starting, is the image is you have your hangout area, you have the table, you have the chairs, and then you just have this big, wide lane in front of you, and you have your candle pin, and you have your candle pin ball. And so this wide bowling lane is going to lead out into the you know the field or whatever you have set up and where i think you start making it fun is right at the end of your big wide lane you just put a ramp you just put like a little ramp and now your start is almost like a ski ball thing where you chuck it as hard as you want bonus points you want to be rewarded for chucking it harder of course so you can set further targets so now you have a reason to throw it hard instead of just decreasing your accuracy so throw the ball out hits the ramp goes out into the field so what does the play area actually look like then? So the, the two things I think that, that for practical matters is one is I was thinking about ball collection and two, I was thinking a bit about gutter balls. And when I think about gutter balls, I want to get rid of them because gutter balls are not fun because basically the way the, 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 the fun works is, you know, you throw the ball, you miss, it goes in the gutter and everyone knows nothing else happens. You feel bad about it. No, everyone knows nothing else is happening from that point forward. You, everyone just watches the ball go into the back of the of the alley, and there's no drama or anything to it. So what I wanted to do, my solution I came up with, is you take the entire field area, and you basically just turn into a, a big bowl. And, haha, bowling, get it? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> now it's, it kind of solves both problems. So one, ball collection. All the balls eventually go down to the middle and can be sucked up in a hole and, you know, get um, sent back to the players. And two, you fuck up and you miss, right? You, you, you're going for a target or some pins set up in this bowl and you miss and now your ball's gone. But you're, you're in a bowl. The ball can start The ball can start curving and it can start looping around. Maybe you hit something on the backswing. And maybe it goes around once or twice before, you know, and you get lucky somewhere along the lane before it runs out of juice and goes down into the into the bottom of the ball. So it's like, it's that moment of, like, you're playing with a kid that, like, throws the ball really, really slow and the ball's rolling down the lane and it's just like, it's not going in the gutter. It's just going, going, going. And who knows if it's going to make it all the way to the end. It's exciting to watch that. It's the fun. It's like mini golf where there's a hill on the other side of the hole and you miss the hole and then it comes back. Yeah, exactly. So... Again, it, it's just, I think it's a great idea. And two, I feel like you'd want some level of challenge. You want it to be just like nonsense the whole way around. And I feel like judging, judging the way your ball will travel around a curve is like the perfect mix of, it's intuitive, but also challenging because you never get it quite right. But you, ha you have an idea of what you want to do. So another thing I've seen in some top golf places, which I think we can repurpose because it's, it's, it's wacky and wild, is that not everyone is necessarily on the ground floor level they'll do it like almost like a sports stadium where there'll be like tiers so you could be like on the second floor and on the third floor and i think it's just like, if you're going to be building this big contraption 
Um, one of the things that a bowling alley does have compared to my thing is that it's much smaller, you know, footprint wise <laughs> per lane <laughs> than mine is. And even though everyone's throwing in the same lane, you're going to need a lot of space. And so you kind of do it. I think it's just as fun to chuck a candle pin ball off like a second story balcony as it was, you know, a first floor as long as the... If, if not more fun, honestly. <laughs> yeah, if not more fun. And I've said this a couple, a couple times already, but this is where it clicked for me ag- yet again. Because imagine you have kind of just like this this one side of a couple stories and you have these people chucking out all these candle pin balls and they're all just kind of coming out all at once. In my mind's eye, that looks just like cannonballs from a pirate ship, like a broadside. So now we've got a theme. So you build your whole thing like a pirate ship. Pirate ship themed brings it back to like this family fun outing because that's really that's what bowling wants to be it doesn't want to be a serious sport for people to master over time it wants to be a family fun outing every part of your answer that you keep on adding on just keeps on reminding me of mini golf (laughs) it really does pirate theme is mini golf 101 right which is why mini golf is so fun and successful because mini golf is god dang awesome and i have no problem riding those coattails (laughs) (laughs) because now you have a pirate ship and now your big bowl it's a whirlpool and now you have just this perfect setting to set up all sorts of props. You can set up pins. You can set up like little ships. You can set up obstacles. You can set up a kraken in the middle. You can do whatever the heck you want to like just make this a really fun, exciting thing. Make things worth different points. Do this, do that. You know, renovate your map. You know, renovate your field every season or something. There's a lot you can do, and I just don't know why people aren't doing it already. So is the pirate theme going to be? part of the sport or are you just saying it's going to be themed in general or does it have to be pirate themed so it does not have to be pirate <laughs> i think mine would be pirate themed because i think it fits perfectly okay you what could if you do a space battle theme you i was gonna say space a, battle, like a black hole it seems perfect as well you could do like a fantasy theme where it's like a castle shooting catapults you can do just like a fun house theme where you have like lots of you know colors and it's a ball pit and some carnival rides and roller coasters and whatnot do like a pinball theme yeah pinball theme is good there's so many themes like this is this is going to be a multi-million idea which is why i said get your patents ready i assume you've been filling it out as i've been talking and i think the last the last the just the icing on the cake i think is it does take a bit of effort to get the can pinball rolling far enough that you could get into this field and make a difference like you have the, like you need the equivalent of the the ramp for kids in the in the bowling alleys so my first thought was just to, well, if you're going to be part of the network, just put them in cannons and shoot them out, which is cool in concept. I think in practicality, that works less. So my practical solution is you have, you have pirate themes, you put up some, you put some crow's nests up above. And what you do is now in those crow's nests, that's where you put the ramps. The kids, the kids climb up to the top and they'll have the regular size bowling balls and they'll roll them down a ramp that goes all the way from the top of the crow's nest into, into the bowl and starts knocking stuff down. And that's just going to be fun for the whole family. And my idea is way better than bowling. And you guys should invest right now. It took me a while to realize what you're talking about when you said the ramps for the kids. But now I, I now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, if you don't, if you're not, or I guess not everyone might know where they are, but they are. So you get for small children in bowling alleys that don't have the strength to roll the ball all the way down the lane. They have like a little slide, a little like two, three foot slide that you can that you can set up in front of the lane. The kid's strong enough to put the ball on top of it, and then the ball just rolls down it and through the lane. And uh, that's what you get from me. Chris, what did, you, what did you do? Can you beat me? I don't know. We'll see. So what I did was, well, first thing, usually when I tackle these sports questions, my main goal is to kind of like keep the essence of the original sport. So I, I try to boil down what I think is the essence of bowling. And I think... There are three things that it has to have. It has to have a ball that's rolling. It has to have pins that you knock down. And it has to have... I know Marcus said that the gutter isn't fun, but I'm gonna, I think that's part of the sport. I think you have to include it. So the gutter is the third part. So when looking at this, I actually started with um, something that Ben found when we were doing our How Would You Improve Golf episode. He, he looked at a, a Gallup poll that asked, what is your favorite sport to watch? And bowling was... So there was a whole list of them, and there was like a legend at the bottom that said if there was a star, then it was less than 0.5%. And Boeing didn't even have a star. Boeing just had a dash. So, and it didn't say what the dash meant. So we don't, 
it's pretty unpopular to watch. <laughs> it's less than less than 5%. That's all we know. Yeah. <laughs> it is no longer in the realm of real numbers. Right. It technically <laughs> exists, but we can't prove it. Right. So I wanted to try to improve the popularity of this. So I, I looked at the top sports on that list. And the top five were football, basketball, baseball, soccer, and hockey. Now, with the exception of baseball, baseball is a little different. But the other four follow basically like the formula for sports, which is you have two sides and they're just opposing each other. And then one team's trying to get to the other side. The other team's trying to get to the other side. So I was like, how can we adapt bowling to this formula to make it more popular? So... The first thing I did was obviously just scale up the lane because if you have two teams on the lane, they just can't fit on the lane. So you have to scale it up. And I said that it's going to be basically like football field size. And the idea is that you'll have pins at like the very ends of both sides, basically like the end zones of the field. And there'll be goalies blocking those pins. I guess technically they won't be called goalies because there's no goal. So... Pennies? Pennies. 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 I guess pennies. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking with this big field, 10 pins isn't really enough. So I kind of want to just like fill the entire, what would be considered the end zone. I want to fill that entire thing with pins. So I looked at how many pins that would actually be. Now, pins are, in, in normal bowling, pins are spaced 12 inches apart from each other. And the, the end zone of a football field is 160 feet by 30 feet. Is it really 12 inches apart? That seems... Yeah, they're, they're 12 inches apart. Wow. I always felt like they were way closer than that. According to the website I found. <laughs> they do look closer than that, but I don't know. They're also like a couple inches in diameter, so it reduces the space between yeah. them. Anyway. Right. But um, yeah, if, if, you, if you have that spacing and you're trying to fit them into this dimension of the end zone, then it comes out to 4,991 pins on each side of the field. I just rounded that up to 5,000. We'll make the end zones a little bigger. And the idea is that each of these pins will basically be like a life for your team. So if a pin gets knocked down, then you lose you lose life. And uh, if all your pins get knocked down, then you lose the game. So you're you're trying to defend your pins. Now to make this more interesting, we kind of want that power struggle like across the field. So like if one team pushes towards one side, then you're like, oh, it's there's progress that way, and it's more interesting. So I wanted to try to emulate that. Um, so I looked at the the two sides. I looked. I first liked. I looked at offense, and how offense would work. So I don't think it's that easy to like run with the bowling ball. So I I went more with like an ultimate frisbee rules type of thing. So like you can't run with the ball. You can like pivot and stuff, but you have to pass or shoot when you have the ball. And the way you pass it, you just roll it across the floor. the The field will still be like a wooden thing, even though I was comparing it to like a, a football field still be wooden i'm imagining now how squeaky this is gonna be and i love and hate it <laughs> well, we'll get <laughs> we'll get to sort of we'll sort of get to that <laughs> yes so that, that, that's how like offense will work defense will be a little different so i think it's it'll be a little too easy to intercept the ball because unlike ultimate frisbee like you can throw a frisbee pretty fast with and like um, get around people and stuff and then the frisbee is in the air and they can't like it's harder to block it a ball is different because it's on the ground you can just like step in front of it or pick it up <laughs> so i'm instituting a rule that you can't intercept the ball and their goal the the goal of the the, the team that's on defense is to knock the ball into the gutters so that's where the gutters come in if the ball goes into the gutters then it goes to the far end of their side, and then they get the ball, and then they become offense. How do they knock it out, out of the way? Yeah, so they're not allowed to touch the ball, so how are they going to knock it out of the way? So anyone that has bowled ever has probably seen the thing where someone accidentally throws the ball too early, and it goes down, and that hits the little pin sweeper thing, <laughs> and that goes into the gutter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm going to give all the all the defensive players their own personal pin sweeper thing. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the technical term, I guess, pin sweeper thing. And I think it's flimsy enough where it's like difficult to kind of deflect it, but it's not it, it's sturdy enough to actually deflect it. 
So that's if they touch the ball themselves, then it's a penalty. But if they use their pin sweeper thing, then they're good and they deflect it into the gutters. I like the idea that it might be too flimsy and that there's a risk of you going to stop it and it just breaks <laughs> through and just hits you in the nuts. Yeah, well, it wouldn't hit you in the nuts. <laughs> well, you have to crouch to get it down, right? Like, what? I, I, I imagine them holding the frame of it, like the 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 bottom part of it. Are you saying the ball is gonna hit them in the nuts? Yeah, if it breaks through their their barrier. <laughs> what's their What's their pose exactly? Are they like <laughs> why the ball is rolling? I imagine them. I imagine them crouched. Like, but if you're to... if you're crouched. How are your nuts at risk? Like, how how are you crouching? I don't... You'd have to be lying on the ground with your legs open for it to hit your nuts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just run and then your legs are apart. You can't see what I'm doing, but I could totally get hit in the nuts it's right now. It's <laughs> not like a baseball where you're, like, fielding a ground ball. That's exactly what it's like. The bowling ball isn't going to bounce up like that. Well, no, the bowling ball's tall, though. How... It's not nut height. <laughs> <laughs> If you're not, if you're crashed, the bowling ball. But like, but like, okay. nuts. But like, if your knees are on the, gr- man, okay. If your knees are on the ground, there's not, the height difference doesn't. There's too much height there. I. One how, so so one one knee. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to try things out. Except my my jeans are slightly too tight. And I'm trying to maintain distance to the microphone. And this is the first episode I've been at a standing desk, and I'm getting punished for it. <laughs> Um, well, you just have to believe me. <laughs> okay, sure. There's a risk that that your nuts will get hit. Fine, whatever. <laughs> um, so that's how defense works. They'll have the sweepers. Now Ben mentioned the squeakiness, but I don't think there's going to be squeakiness because another part, another essence of bowling that I kind of left out before. Um, but I do think it is a legit essence of bowling is the bowling shoes. So you have to be wearing the bowling shoes. All the players are going to be wearing bowling shoes. And if you know, if you've worn bowling shoes before, you know that they're slippery because their soles are made of leather. So you're going to be sliding around all the way, all, the, all over the place. And one thing that I didn't know before researching this was that bowling lanes are actually oiled to protect the surface and to just make the ball roll smoother. So you're going to have your bowling shoes that are slippery and the lane is also, the field is also going to be oiled. So I don't think there's going to be any squeaking going on. It's going to be a lot of sliding, though. It's going to be fun. <laughs> there is going to be a lot of sliding. <laughs> the, like, the person puts the sweeper down, and they just it just hit, the bowling ball hits them, and they just start sliding away. The ball <laughs> momentum is unaffected. <laughs> yeah. And it, what what's fun about this is that I don't think we have to make the gutters only for the ball. People are going to be sliding around. <laughs> they can <laughs> accidentally slide into the gutters. Now... My initial idea was this was for it to be like the gutters to be like a slide basically and that you'd slide down to the the other side of the field. I don't know exactly how that would work because it would have to be inclined. I don't actually think it would work. But the gutters could just be like a conveyor belt or something and you, if you slide into it, you get carried to the end of the field and then you have to run all the way back. Same goes for a penalty if you do a penalty if you like touch the ball accidentally with your body then you have to go to the gutter and then you get carried to the end of the field so that's that i think that makes gutters fun (laughs) that would make gutters a lot more fun than typical gutters yeah if if, if there's primarily people on them gutters are much more fun (laughs) (laughs) yeah so that's that's basically how my sport will work it'll just be two opposing sides with the gutters and the apparently the risk of your nuts getting hit by the ball (laughs) i still don't buy it yeah, I don't buy it still, but Ben um, Marcus insists, so we'll let him have that. <laughs> ben, what did you do? So I I also considered the popularity of bowling, um, although I did it ironically. Ironically, you used the way that I did the last time we did this. I used a different method to determine popularity this time, uh, which was I searched for bowling on YouTube, and and the first the first videos that came up had like a hundred thousand views or so. That was like the most popular ones that popped up first. And from there, I found like the Professional Bowling Association YouTube channel, which had one hundred and seventy seven thousand subscribers, and they got like five to twenty five thousand views on most of their videos. Like sort of sort of you know they're, they're like average videos, which is is okay, but you know definitely we could do some improving here, and. I think that sort of that's. I think my main goal here is to make bowling a more 
watchable spectator sport, right? And specifically in today's day and age, to make it much more internet friendly. Because clearly that's the way that, that popularity is really measured now is how, you know, popular things are on the internet. So what's popular on the internet? And there's really nothing more popular on the internet than animals. So for a comparison, I went to the YouTube channel, The Dodo. Now you probably know The Dodo because you've seen their videos pop up in your Facebook feed like 8,000 times at this point. They're all animal videos. They're very frequently very heartwarming because it's like someone who rescued a shelter dog who like wouldn't look at people in the eye and they fed them pizza for three days and now they're best friends or something. I said that as a joke, but actually I'm pretty sure the last one that popped up in my Facebook feed was actually like someone who rescued a dog and fed him a hamburger the first night or something. So that's not even much of a joke. That's how they get you. They, they tell the stories that already exist. Yeah. Well, there it is. So, but... The Dodo, as opposed to the 177,000 subscribers of the Professional Bull Association, has 6.5 million subscribers. And their most popular video, which is dog yoga, Pup is really happy to be in his mom's yoga workout, which is a 30 second long video that's exactly what it sounds. It's just like a Dalmatian that's all up in its owner's grill while she does yoga, <laughs> um, has just under 122 million views when I checked today. Wow. So what did you retire on? Well, I did yoga this one time. <laughs> <laughs> and for 30 seconds, my dog bothered me. And then I never worked again. <laughs> so clearly what we've learned here is that the first rule of the internet is that adding animals to something makes people want to watch it more. Note, note for the podcast. I, 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 I mean, I do. I added animals to our podcast this time. I'm doing my part, guys. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I thought people like sports. <laughs> I mean, I'm hitting all our bases, guys. Well, not that was a different episode. Hey, anyway. But uh, I'm going to figure out how many places can we shoehorn in animals into bowling. So first stop, first thing we're going to do. What about those stupid, terrible little hand dryers that have the ends of bowling alleys, right? You know, the ones that like don't actually do anything, but you still use it for once in a while just to like feel cool. I like using it because it feels cool. It, exactly, right? It makes it's, me feel it's like useless. a professional. It's useless, yeah, it's, but... It's, it's what you do when you're, when you're just talking like you know, trash talk, be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a strike now that I've dried my hands. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out how do we, how do we like generate wind like that? Right. My first thought was a bird, just like how a bird like flap its wind or something. For some reason, I couldn't find any numbers on like the wind force generated by a bird flapping its wings. I, I may have just been like Googling the wrong thing. So I just kept getting, you know, articles explaining how birds fly, which involved wind, which didn't really meet my needs. So I went down other paths, and I eventually decided on, what about dolphins? So it turns out dolphins can actually exhale air at up to 100 miles an hour. Okay, we can do that too. Well, not, not that fast. Wait, hold on. There's no it's called sneezing. Okay, fine. Well, <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to... Sh <laughs> God, I mean, gosh. <laughs> well, I mean, gosh. it's funny. It's funny you say that, because also, <laughs> also I... Um, I saw that number. I was like, wow, that's a really big number. And there's going to be like some crazy number that was really insane. And I looked up how fast a Dyson Airblade hand dryer is. How fast would you guess the air from a Dyson Airblade hand dryer is? Those are the ones that like had a little slit that like sprays out like a, you know, like a sheet of air. Okay. Without the context of what we're talking about ra right now, I would guess 85 miles an hour. That's kind of what I had in mind too, actually, when I first was like thinking about this whole thing. Turns out it's 420 miles per hour. <laughs> That seems irresponsible. It seems irresponsible, <laughs> but I've used those several thousand times and I still have my hands. So, okay, several thousand is probably an exaggeration, but a lot of times. And I still have hands. So, clearly it's fine. It does seem like that is pretty fast for a hand air dryer. Um, the ones I was seeing for, like, bathrooms generally these days are, like, 200 miles per hour, um, which is still clearly faster than a dolphin. To be fair, as we discussed... The blow dryers on a bowling lane are useless, so this is probably an improvement. So I'm going to say it still works. You couldn't find numbers for the actual bowling one? I actually have a note that literally just says couldn't find any numbers for the actual bowling lane hand dryers. I really tried. Do you think, do you think, do you think the, the air from a dolphin's blowhole would be at all moist? So You know what? Ignore that question. That's a bad question. <laughs> yeah, we're going, pretend, we're going to pretend that it's not. <laughs> we're going to pretend we can like, dry them out? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Look, if you got dolphin boogers on your hands, you're just going to stop using the dolphin hair blow dryer like you don't use the useless bowling one anyway. Well, so you use, you use the dolphin and then you use the bowling one to get the boogers off your hands. <laughs> it's a, we got a system. So we have, we have our, our blow dryer set. What about resetting the pens? And basically, resetting the pens is basically like one of those, you know, 
like the like a block puzzle, right? We're like putting blocks into slots and stuff. You know who loves doing puzzles like that? Octopuses. <laughs> Apparently, I know we talk about octopuses a lot on the show. They don't have enough. They don't have enough tentacles, though. Wait, what? They don't have enough tentacles. They're just ten pins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, like they can they can do it in two batches. It'll be fine. It's inefficient. <laughs> It's gets, more, more efficient squids. than most animals. <laughs> yeah, it's about twice as efficient as than the majority of animals. I, I also like the idea that we're like, we replaced this robot designed to put pens back on octopus and had less efficiency somehow. <laughs> How'd that happen? I was literally just talking about, I was literally just talking the other day with Sarah about how I would, if I had the opportunity and the means, I would seriously consider giving up all my other hobbies just to raise an octopus. I mean, they're really cool. And I, I've learned, so one of the things I learned when I was looking this up, like, you know, mostly just look at videos of octopuses doing puzzles. Um, I learned that apparently they actually, like, get unhappy if they don't get things like that to do with their minds. Like, they, they'll just get bored and start, like, acting out. So apparently it is something they will enjoy doing. So it's, you know, I feel a little better about enlisting them in resetting the pens of the bowling alley. And since they'll probably actually enjoy it. Then they'll lash out if you don't get any business. Uh, yeah, so there's, you know, you got a, you got some problem there. But, you know, you'll just, everyone's going to want to come and play with the dolphins and octopuses and, you know, do all that. You'll, you don't have to worry about that. It is octopuses and not octopi, right? Wait, I, I think, think we confirmed that before. Both. I think, I think, no, it, is it officially it is, octopuses? It's, it's octopuses. There's some debate, but it's officially octopuses. I did a octopus-themed board game brought to a convention where I met hundreds of people, and that was probably my most had conversation because i had octopus facts on my as part of my display and i used the phrase octopuses and people are like is it an octopi and i'm like no actually and I, I had a little more factoid there i forget the there's like some origin somewhere but uh, it's octopuses is the is the correct one if you if you're arguing about being semantic which if you're talking about which way it's octopus you already are it's octopuses if you enjoy interacting with other human beings and want to continue doing that let them say what they want <laughs> but by the way just just quickly when you started telling the story i was so convinced you're going to say i took this to the game of conventions and i met hundreds of octopus researchers <laughs> and they all talk about how it's the octopus it's not octopi <laughs> <laughs> i posed the same question to every single one is it octopuses and they said yes <laughs> um man we're so all right i guess since we're already so on so many tangents anyway my next point was actually also a tangent I started just looking into, like, animals solving puzzles and using tools in general. Um, I'd already pretty much decided on octopuses because, you know, the tentacles would let them be faster than a lot of things. But I just want to know what my other yeah, options were. Yeah, eight tentacles, ten pins. It's perfect. Exa yeah, right? Math. But I did learn that apparently uh, it's been scientifically shown that crows actually enjoy using tools. There was this study that was done where basically they had to figure out how – first, how to – the idea was to figure out if they enjoy using tools. That wasn't the entire point of the study, which, once again, science is buck wild, and I love it. But the way they like to determine this, they basically had these crows, and they would put them in a room with a box with food in it on either, like, the left or the right side. And if it was on the left side, they would have, like, a little small bit of food. If it was on the right side, it would have a bunch. And eventually, the crows learned when, you know, it was on the left side, it had a little food. On the right side, it had a bunch. And they would go faster to the box than what was on the right side of the room because they knew that there would be more food there. And then what they started doing was, I guess also, to open the box, they'd either have them just open it with their beak or they would get them like a stick or something to open it with. And then what they started doing was putting the box in the middle of the room so the crow didn't know if it would have a lot or a little food. And they would basically have them open the box without a tool or with a tool and then when they brought them in to the room with the box in the middle, measure how long it took them to go up to the box to see how excited they were. Which is the most hilarious methodology I've ever heard, but they actually got, like, scientifically significant, like, results using it, where it took them, it was, like, 12 seconds to get to the box when they had just used a tool and 23 seconds if they hadn't used a tool or something. I just want to see the, I just want to see the axis labeled crow excitement. Right. It's very seconds. good. <laughs> it's, it's science remains the things that people get paid to investigate remain incredible to me. Even, you know, however long into doing this podcast and looking at random ass research all the time, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible. Anyway, point being, 
apparently a lot of animals actually just do enjoy solving puzzles and using tools, which is kind of cool. I like that. It's nice. Fun little fact I learned. Anyway, back to bowling because we've been away from that for like five minutes now. So we have our, 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 our blow dryer. We have our pen resetting. And I realized that you're running out of things involved in bowling. <laughs> There's not that much that goes into bowling. I considered like having something return the ball, but it was just going to be like something throwing the ball back. And it just wasn't really, it was like, yeah, a gorilla throws the ball back. Yay. I guess you can do that. That's fine. Whatever. But it's not really, you know. Have like a monkey carry it back. Then you get to interact with the monkey. Yeah. Like there's, but, but it's like, it's still kind of, you know, there's, there's limits there. An elephant picks up this trunk and throws it to you. Yeah, I mean, but it's still, yeah. It's like, obviously, it's not bad. Another person bowls it back to you. (laughs) Point being, we have to go bigger, which is where I started looking into actually replacing the ball with an animal. So the reason I actually went down the animal path to begin with is that originally you're supposed to talk about turtles on this episode. I just want to talk about turtles some. But then I decided that, that sliding turtles at bowling pins is probably not very good because they're not going to be able to get fast enough on their own because turtles are notoriously slow. <laughs> the problem is you just set them up on the line and they don't go anywhere. Right, they just like, you know. That's the problem with this plan. <laughs> Point being, it was either going to take a very long time to be ineffective or feel cruel. So I wanted an animal that would actually propel themselves into the ball but still be relatively bowling ball-like. I somehow didn't think of armadillos, now I'm very sad. <laughs> Wait, you just had that realization right now. I did. That's kind of embarrassing, actually. Probably should have been armadillos. Anyway. It's probably also still cruel to throw an armadillo. Yeah. I mean, I guess the armadillos don't, like, run and roll themselves into balls and anything aside from cartoons. So it's probably still cruel. Point being, what I did instead was penguins. Because penguins, they don't move very fast when they're walking because they kind of, you know, just waddle around. But to move quickly, what they'll do is what they'll call tobogganing, where they just throw themselves onto their bellies and slide. And apparently, not only is it a faster way to move down hills and stuff, they also just really like doing it. It's, once again, they just, like, do it for funsies, apparently, which is adorable. (laughs) So I figure now you have, it's it's also very conveniently now, very, you know, aquarium-themed. You have dolphins, octopuses, penguins. That's all the animals I've mentioned, but they're all aquatic. And you kind of have this, this, like, aquarium bowling alley situation where you have penguins who are actually the balls, who I don't know if you, like... Yeah, then what are you doing? So I couldn't decide if the penguins run and toboggan themselves or you like hold them by the belly and like swing them out <laughs> onto the lane. You, you, they hold on to a rope and you spin them around yourself and you let go. That does seem very fun. It seems also not great, but you can figure it out. Point being, penguins like sliding. They'll be down for this. And a penguin can go into bowling pants. They'll be fine. Okay, here's, here's, here's how you actually do the penguins. There is a slot, like the top of the thing is a slot, so they get some speed. And the way you, you know, throw the penguin is you get a little fish and you throw it on the slide at the place where you want the penguin to go f- go for it. So that actually... And the penguin chases the fish and then boom. That actually leads into my other idea that was not aquatic themed, so I decided to go with this one instead. Which was your, I guess, ball is just a tennis ball. And your actual ball has the pen is a golden retriever. Um, and you just throw the tennis ball towards the pens, and however many balls the golden retriever knocks down while getting the tennis ball is how many pens you knock down. You're probably going to get a lot of strikes. That's also hilarious. Yeah. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I had to go with the aquatic theme once I realized the possibility for it. But golden retriever bowling is very good. Yeah, there's also definitely no upper limit on how many times a golden retriever will dopely run into the same pins. Oh no, it's going <laughs> to happen so many times, yeah. I, I do think the one, the biggest problem with Golden Retriever Bowling is I don't think you'll ever not get a strike, right? Like You don't have to worry about getting the ball back, though. That's true. You take that whole thing out of the equation. It's very good. And that's mostly what I have, honestly. I think really the main takeaway here is that things are better with animals. Like, that's not a surprising thing. We all know that. Do you think the, octop- do you think the octopuses slowly grow to hate the penguins? Oh, <laughs> undoubtedly. <laughs> <laughs> Where? The octopus is just having its good old time. Just like so, it's like ah, I've sorted the pins into the right spot, and this pen, dopey penguin goes boom. I also like the idea that that the octopus sees a fish and is like ooh a fish, and then the penguin slams through the pens, steals the fish, and is gone. <laughs> That's the gutter ball. Is when the octopus gets the, gets the fish. fish yeah. First. <laughs> uh, so that's my plan. Just throw a fish at it. I don't know. 
Dang, I think Ben may have b- done the best sport. <laughs> was it dog bowling? Is it just dog bowling? No, 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 no. I think the I think the whole aquatic theme is the best oh, nice. sport. Out of, I, I, out I like three. I like the dog bowling. I, I give you options, man. I think dog bowling is actually a good one to just do in your backyard over the summer. Yeah, uh, dog bowling is like a good, yeah. a real good thing. <laughs> it is actually just if you have a dog and like a kid's bowling set, do dog bowling. It's gonna be great. Everyone's <laughs> gonna love it. Okay, Ben, this is this would you rather is a food question, so I'm gonna direct it towards you. Ooh. Would you rather eat only using your fingers or only using chopsticks? So I'm decent with chopsticks. I'm not great, but I'm 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 good enough. Uh, see, okay, so here's the problem is that I feel like there's a lot of foods <laughs> you just can't really eat either way. Yeah. Like soups. They, both of them well, yeah, that both of them can't do, but then both of them limit different groups of food that you can't eat. So, like, yeah. you can eat some foods with your hands that you can't eat with chopsticks and the other way around. Anything that's not already bite size is a lot harder, but not necessarily impossible to eat with chopsticks. I mean, you can break it up into smaller pieces. Yeah, the ones just... that I was thinking of, like, cereal would be really annoying. <laughs> not, not like Cheerios. Just run them up. Yeah, but you'd have to... Uh, you mean like yep, stick the entire em. thing through? There you go. Is a chopstick small enough? Chopsticks are kind probably of... not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll put it this way: if, I think the hands opens you up to more food because even soups, like if you're the person who's eating with their hands, you can scoop soup. You can get a you can get a good. Pretend you can, like burn yeah, your, your hands, hands together. It limits. You soup. can't like eat anything too hot. Yeah. Yeah, you have to wait for it to cool a little bit, but you're not getting any with chopsticks. Yeah. I'm, I'm just imagining how sad it would be to have, like, a bowl of chicken noodle soup and just eat all of, like, the carrot chunks and noodles out and just have, like, a bowl of chicken broth in front of you you can't do anything with. Oh, that's brutal. That is brutal. So I think what it comes down to is you're weird either way. Like, again, like, socially, you're weird either way. Oh, yeah. You're either the person who eats only with chopsticks or only eats with their hands. In terms of etiquette, chopsticks are way more polite. Yeah, eating with just chopsticks puts you, is at least respectable. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, oh, you only eat with chopsticks because, you know, whatever reason. But that's just what you do. Counterpoint. I think that there are more foods you can eat with your hands that you can get away with than foods you can eat with chopsticks and have it not look weird. So if you very carefully choose where you go, like, out to eat, you can appear normal as long as you always order, like, sandwiches and burritos and burgers and stuff like that. Yeah. There are a lot of hand foods. Whereas really, for for chopsticks, it's just, you know, Asian food. And like, specifically really like just Chinese and Japanese, right? I can't really use chopsticks with like Thai. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But I think like, it it comes down to the scenarios where you can't avoid it. Where, Mm -hmm. do you want to be like, hey, I can't eat this because I have chopsticks. Versus the situations where I can't eat this, you know, I can't eat this respectively because I have to eat it with my hands. Funnily, sushi is actually works for both because eating sushi is, I mean, culturally, it, sushi was originally eaten by hands. It was like a, a street food that you eat with your fingers. I think in the States, if you go to like a fancy sushi place, you're more, it's more, you're more expected to eat with chopsticks than with your hands, but you could make a cultural argument there. I'm kind of on a tangent here for no reason. <laughs> That's what we do here. I mean, I've seen plenty of people eat sushi with their hands. So let's say you go to a nice steakhouse. Yeah, steakhouse is tricky. So let's talk about the steakhouse. So you go to the steakhouse... Someone has to cut it up. Like, someone cuts it up for you. Is that allowed? I think yes. You have to ask. You know, you have to awkwardly ask someone to do it for okay. you. Okay. Oh, no. And then someone hands you back a plate of cut up of steak, and either you eat with chopsticks, or you just go ham with your hands. So even if, you, if you're eating with your hands, you could potentially not ask them to cut it up and just pick it up and bite it. <laughs> Is that better? What's <laughs> what's more awkward, being the guy who asked for the server to cut up your steak for you or being the guy who's, who like gets like a nice filet mignon and just says thank you, picks it up and takes a big honk and bite out of it. <laughs> I mean, like, either I way, you're still going to be eating it with your hands even if you do ask them to cut it up for you. As a man who has literally done exactly that um, <laughs> in our California oh, trip yeah. then, we had, uh, we had uh, like 18 of us or whatever in Airbnb, um, and we cooked steaks, and they were awesome. But we did we actually didn't have enough silverware to go around for everybody. And rather than like waiting for someone to, you know, finish their silverware, go and then like clean it and bring it back, I got a steak handed to me. I'm just like, F it. 
<laughs> and then just picked it up a full steak and just like went at it. <laughs> I was very drunk at the time and it felt very like primal and manly to do that. So that was a positive experience for me. I don't think that would transfer to any other sober day. Right. <laughs> But that that scenario would be impossible with chopsticks. Mm, that's true. You could pick up a whole steak with chopsticks. And you can just... pick it up, but you can't really bite it and like hold on to the steak with your chopsticks. While what if you're you? It. What if you jab both chopsticks into and through it and lift it that way? And eat it like a skewer. Yeah. I guess it depends on how tender the steak is and how easily it you can bite into it. If you can't bite into your steak get a new steak you just say you, you just, we've just saved you from yourself right but you could pull it off you could just go hey you just jam this chopstick all the way through the steak like long ways and you're like guys you ever do steak skewers and you just go for it and you're like this is what i do <laughs> that is still weird <laughs> i mean yeah it is weird we're not gonna we're not gonna deny that one all right so like it seems to be like the, the points of contention are soups mm -hmm. liquid like soups are no go with chopsticks can be done with hands not ideally with hands. So that's like kind of like a little gray. The steak dinner, I don't think we landed on which one's better. <laughs> which one you'd rather do. I'm also thinking of like, if you're sharing food, it's like pretty gross if you're using your hands. That's Ooh, a good point. That's really true, yeah. actually. Dang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to unpack here. See, I was gonna I was going to say hands because I feel like you're going to have to awkwardly explain this to people eventually. And it's easier to put that off by going to lower commitment restaurants that have sandwiches, burritos, or whatever for longer. I got it. I got. I got. It. I got where I would do what I would do with it. You pick the. I pick chopsticks because you know how it went around for a while. It's like, oh yeah, the smart way to eat Cheetos is with chopsticks. Oh my god! So you're just gonna say that you're you like just, taking it to the next say, level? Yeah, you're just like, hey, I tried that and it worked great for me, and I kind of just incorporated that into the rest of my life. <laughs> And then you have your stupid reason, but it gets you out of the conversation and people will just have to accept that that's what you do because Cheetos. I mean, the logic behind eating Cheetos with chopsticks works, though, for the scenario, because if you're eating with your hands, then you're always going to have to like your hands are always going to be dirty after you eat. That's true. Whereas if you're eating with chopsticks, you can just like carry on a like, plastic bag or something, put them in the plastic bag. It pains me, but I think I might have to go with chopsticks as well. I think you swayed me. Yeah, I'm going chopsticks. I'm also going chopsticks. I don't want to be... I'd rather be the weird, overly sophisticated man than the, the the primal ape who eats everything with their hands. Because I think it's just... It's harder to explain away. Even as weird as it sounds, it's harder to explain away eating everything with your hands. Because it's like, no, you're gross. And, uh, wow. We don't, agree, we don't all agree very often. So there it is. It is. The answer is chopsticks. Go live your life by it if you are forced into this by, I guess, a... Man at gunpoint after he asks you, like, a high school math problem? A mystical food genie. Ooh. <laughs> Except instead of wishes, he yeah, grants you weird would-you-rather questions. A mystical food witch? A Ouija? <laughs> He's a witchy. A witchy. Where he, you, you have to pick which one you want. <laughs> right. <laughs> the magical food witchy. And that is the high point of the episode. So we're going to cut it right there. If you enjoy the show... Go to, please go to our Patreon, www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals. Click that become a patron button. It's just $1. You get bonus episodes. You know the drill. Go and do it. It's easy. It's great. Thank you for that. Thank, now that you're back and having, after having done that, pause the episode, come back and had done that. We're good. And uh, that also gives you the privilege to listen to next week's episode where we're doing a long grab bag <laughs> long grab bag sure yeah we'll give contact we'll explain <laughs> it'll make more sense <laughs>